Well, when I was growing up, I actually went to church. Most of my life I was at church. I was at Sunday school, Bible school, and I really liked it because it was a place where I could play. And I had little friends, and uh, I just remember learning the Ten Commandments. That was like the main thing. Uh, where I grew up, it, church is so different now, but we were taught that Jesus was this really nice guy, and He forgave our sins, and God was the really angry one. He was really mad at us, and if we were naughty, He would correct us. I really ne never learned about the Holy Spirit. So I, I grew up in a home that was real strict, disciplinary-wise. A lot of my friends had freedom to do things at school, to hang out, to spend the nights at each other's houses. And pretty much in my house, it wasn't like that. My dad was a real strict uh, type of upbringing because of the fact that he was a military person, and my grandfather was, and then my grandfather before that. So there was this like you know type of rule law that if we were naughty, we got punished for it. And so I think what I did is I, I correlated you know, my upbringing and the way my father was towards us kids, that, we, that he didn't love us. And I think I kind of compared him to God because God was always upset and there was always a consequence to everything we did wrong. And the Jesus part was like my mom. My mom was really graceful. So I, I became really bitter at a very young age because I didn't understand why my dad would tell us to do something. He didn't always explain it. So it started with a root of unforgiveness for my daddy. I think that I thought that I was unlovable because I was, I was kind of bad. I'm being honest with you. I was rambunctious. I was a, like an intention seeker. I used to, you know, be the class clown in school. I loved having fun. Later on, as I grew up as a teen, I wanted to do things that I couldn't. And so when I couldn't do it, I would make it happen. I'd stay out late at parties or I'd lie and spend the night at my girlfriend's houses and I'd actually be drinking all night long or smoking pot all night long with my friends. And I started to become very promiscuous. I noticed that boys were noticing me as puberty hit. And I started realizing that I could actually gain attention. And like this studium of like outward love because they liked the way I looked and the way I acted that I was crazy. And they took advantage of that. In school, it was cool to sleep with someone that you were in love with. And so it, I was accepted at my class, but rejected at the church. And it felt to me like God was angry at me. And I actually started to really, really consider that God wasn't real. That maybe this is just a man-made thing. That, that wh why, why are there so many rules and why, why are there so many people judging me? And so, yeah, that partying in the beginning started with promiscuity, parties. I graduated high school and I started to go out to the clubs. I had fake ID. Basically, I hung out with people that had the same view as me. You know, I'm just being honest. Screw the church, screw religion, and I'm just going to be who I am going to be and I'm going to have people love me for who I am and not put rules, you know, conditions on me for them to love me. I ended up meeting these guys with my girlfriend and we eventually, you know, started hanging out with them a lot. They had ca nice cars, jewelry, just really believing that money would make us happy. And you know, that was our, I was already conditioned for that anyway, because I remember distinctly when I was younger that I think that I was taught like subliminally that gifts mean that you're doing good, you know? So if I had nice things that people would look at me and they would respect me. Naturally, when my girlfriend called me up and said, you know what, I'm in Hawaii. You're working three jobs, sister. Come on. Three, four bucks an hour. Are you serious? Girl, I'm making 500 bucks an hour. And I was like, what? And what are you doing? She's like, well, just come here and find out. Just know that you don't have to do it, but if you do, just take two weeks vacation. And I totally was like, okay. She fell in love with one of the guys. So I came out to Hawaii, and that's the first night I ever turned my first trick. On vacation. Waikiki Beach. And it was so simple. I didn't have, have sex with the guy. And he was Japanese. And I made this little rule within myself. I'll only date Japanese guys for two weeks. And then I'll come back to Minnesota with all my money and all my glamour and all my rings and all my little new outfits and wardrobe. And just I'll just play it off like I never did this. Didn't work like that. Because once I started doing it, Pandora's box opened. Worms upon worms coming out. Once you make that money, it is so completely addictive. It is so 
over the top crazy. I mean, it's, you want the designer this and designer that. And when I was in high school, you had to have Nikes. You had to have Calvin Klein jeans. You had to have Ula La Sassoon jeans and Gloria Vanderbilt. Now I'm aging myself, but I don't care because that's what made you accepted. That's what made you loved in so many senses. They're just having those nice things, you know, having that college education, having that beautiful car, that's the American dream, right? How do you get the American dream? You're supposed to go to college, right? You're supposed to like work hard. I saw the shortcut and I was like, screw this. I want that pow, like the dynamite stick. I want it to go off immediately. And I want my friends to wonder, how the heck did you get that? And that's what I was, you know, believing in. I got back to Minnesota, told my supervisor I quit. There was a rumor going around that I was a prostitute. I was like, you know what? Let them think that, but I quit. Started escorting, um, didn't have a pimp in the beginning. It was my choice was against pimps. And so the guy that I met one night at the strip club, I was working at a strip club and I was turning dates out of the strip club. Great way to make money when you're a stripper and a prostitute at the same time, heck yeah. So I met this guy that was tipping me big money. He was a drug dealer, fell in love with the guy. Told me he was against pimps too. Told me he wasn't a pimp, but he had a lot of friends that were, but he wasn't gonna pimp me out. And pretty much overnight, I learned the hard way when we got down to Vegas together he was going to be in control of all the money. He was going to do, say what I did. He was going to decide who I talked to, who I didn't talk to, who I could call, who I couldn't call. And I ended up in a prison in Las Vegas as a sex slave. Pure passion. A heart that beats for Christ alone. There was a huge battle going on when I started prostituting because here I am raised as this little Christian girl. I mean, seriously, I believed in God and I loved Jesus. I had an epiphany with Jesus when I was eight. I mean, I, even though I was being sexually abused when I was eight, not by a family member, but a good friend, I still loved him. And deep inside, it's so crazy to say this, I had major slippery grace for myself because I knew he loved me deep down, just deep down. And I knew somehow out of every mess that I made in my life, being a prostitute, he'd forgive me. Yeah, I knew it. I knew it. It was like a secret that I did not want anyone else to know. It, deep inside, I knew when I knocked on a door and I knew it might've been a rapist or a killer or anything like that. I'd pray to Jesus and say, Jesus, please tell God I'm sorry. I was always in life-threatening situations. Are you kidding me? Yes. High-class escorting has no difference than the street. The only difference with the high-class escorting and the street is where you're doing it at. You can do it in a car, do it behind a building, do it in an alleyway. It's the same thing, the same dangers. I, I, I've had clients that were in suites of hotels that were $10,000 suites a night rape me with a gun to my head. Yeah, throw, try to throw me out the window. Murder me, I mean, it's crazy. It sounds crazy, but it's true. And I think that a lot of girls don't realize when they get into this, you know, until they have their first rape, their first slap, their first, uh, you know, attempted murder from a client, that they do realize the dangers of it. I, I've been choked by clients that, you know, they, they choked me to the point where I've been asphyxiated, where I, couldn't, I couldn't, didn't wake up for minutes or maybe a half an hour after they choked me. And I've woken up and they're gone. They've checked out of their room, they're gone, and there's no proof of what they've done to me. So it's very, very dangerous, just on the client base. Now, I'm not even gonna go into what the pimps do. Not every pimp's bad, by the way, but any man that is using you to make a profit is not in your best interest at heart. It's really sad, but it's the truth. that They are a aggressor, they are a user, and they are an abuser. You're trapped, like you, you believe the money is of greater, greater plus than the, the danger. Like you're taking a gamble and especially when I was with my pimp, I wanted to please him. And if I had to brag about almost dying for him, I was considered what they call a down hoe, a bad bottom girl. He loved me more because I risked my life more. And see, if you are doing it 
as a sacrifice for someone's love for you, that doesn't even hit you in the forefront. And then let's flip the coin. You leave your pimp. Now you're doing it because you're trying to make back the five years of the money you gave to that pimp, which was easily anywhere from a million to five million dollars you gave that pimp. And you've got to play catch up. You justify the next day. You're broken down, but you justify the next day to make up that money. Because you know if you don't, everyone's going to laugh at you. And not only everyone, and not only your ex-pimp and all the people that knew you, and the phone girls and everyone that knew you in the industry, but you laugh at yourself. And the biggest person to overcome in this business is yourself and your conscience, telling you, see, I told you you were a failure. Failure, see, I told you you were no good. See, I told you you couldn't handle this. Prove to me you can. Make it happen. And that beating, that rape, that abuse, it's a cycle. It just continues. You ebb and flow with it. And you handle it. And you just become stronger and stronger to this point where you become so numb that when you do eventually crack, now you need drugs. Now you need alcohol. Now you need a crutch for someone to tell you, you can do this. And that's what happened to me. I was sober the first 10 years I did it. Totally sober. Didn't do drugs or anything. Occasionally had some drinks, but they didn't affect my work. I never was, never was high or drunk working, ever. But on the 11th year, that's when the cocaine abuse came in. That's when the pills came in. Only because I had cancer. Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I took a painkiller because I had really bad back pain from the chemo and the radiation therapy. Got so addicted to it. And then I was already sick of working. I hated working. I would schedule at the end like three days a week. I couldn't do it seven days like I used to because it was killing me. It was killing me. But when I got those pills in me, when I got that kook in me, it gave me courage to do it seven days again. And then I realized, wow, if I just do this and just you know, do this full time and get high every day, I don't have to feel the pain that's built up all these years and all the shame and the aggression and the, the mistrust and the unforgiveness. And, the, you know, most of the thing is that when you do this is that the shame hits you so deeply in the beginning. But then doing it so long, you get numb. But then at the end of it, you start to feel that shame like triple, quadruple because you know what you've done hasn't made anything any better. In fact, it's made it worse. God started to woo me. When I found out that I had cancer, and I prayed to him, I said, God, I know you might be mad at me. And I know that Jesus died for my sins, so I just ask you that you cure me. And I prayed to him. It's so crazy. But yeah, I had, I had the nerve to pray to him when I was knocking on doors and ask him to protect me. I had the nerve to pray to him and to ask to forgive me and to, to heal my body. And I would draw these pictures of these angel cells coming after the devil cells. And um, I truly believe that that's when God intervened in my life. And that was in 95. And I kept praying, pray for a way for me to get out of this, Lord, please. I need a way out. And I don't know what to do. I quit doing drugs. He helped me quit. And I actually started studying Buddhism for a while and um, about just reading the Proverbs in the Buddha Bible. And they call it the Buddha Bible. You know, Christians might not call it that, but I did. And I didn't realize, but God was chipping away at my heart. Not the Buddha, not, not you know, the Wiccan God. It was like God, the real God, the omnipresent God. I needed Jesus. Like, I needed to know Jesus was God. I needed to know Jesus was the Holy Spirit. And it's like he showed me. I'm everything. I'm everything you need. I'm that success you feel so desperately wanted within yourself. I'm that little word you needed spoken by your daddy. I'm, I'm that thing that you crave when, you, when, when you're held after sex. That's who I am. Comfort. I'm peace, I'm joy. And, and when I reached out for him, and it was August 2nd, 2003, I called out when I overdosed. I had the heart attack and I said Jesus' name. And it's like I felt that peace come into me for the first time in my life, like the real peace. 
that he was like, God was like, I've been with you the whole time. He's like, the whole time. When you were working, when you had the pimp, when you were rebelling against me, when you were 16, when you were 17, when you were 12, when you were eight, when you were five, I've been with you this whole time. The first time you ever said my name, yeah, I never let you go. And I carried you. And when you ran from me, I picked you back up and said, come here, little girl. And it's like knowing that, just knowing that realization that God never let go of me, I think brought that peace. He really started to tell me himself. It was crazy. Like, some people don't come to God like that, but I did. Like, I seriously sought him. And really, he showed up. I mean, he absolutely showed up like a miracle inside my heart. You know, the key to my, to my recovery and the key to my success and the key to me knowing who Jesus is was falling in love with him. And I think I fell in love with him when I knew that he absolutely loved me, like 100%. And when I started reading the Bible and I started to understand that his love has no bounds and it's unconditional. And knowing that just prompted me to reach out to my friends. I wanted to tell my friends. And I had the guts to finally come to church again. And I knew for some reason deep in the back of my heart that I might get hurt again, but I had to trust God. I had to trust Jesus that even if I did get hurt by someone that judged me, that I could still love them. So I started to go to church again and I started to bring girls to church. And eventually a lot started coming. And they started getting like saved and dedicated to God and their life started changing and I had nowhere to put them. And so the church that I was going to uh, at that moment in time was Church of South Las Vegas, Pastor Benny Perez. And he said that him and his wife were praying that they would have a way to reach girls that were sex trafficked. And so I came to their church and a couple years back, I uh, got this call from my pastor, and you know as well as I do, if your pastor calls you on your cell phone, either it's really good news or really bad news, okay? And so he called me up, and he had tears in his voice, and he said, Annie, we have a house for the women. He goes, there's nowhere to put them. You've been putting them in hotels or whatever else, and maybe letting them stay with you a bit. I just want to let you know that we have a house now. Would you like to run it? Would you like to join in this venture with us? to reach these women, and I said, absolutely, yes. And Hookers for Jesus was already born. That was the name of my ministry, Outreach. I started reaching out to the girls in the casinos and doing outreaches and giving them uh, little cards to invite them to church, and I give them, like, gift cards to buy, like, a latte with, and then I started giving them gift bags, and that just catapulted the ministry. And we had this house, and it's like it, it was named Destiny House because of a, a girl that was you know, my, one of my children that I had a miscarriage with that never had a chance to see life on the earth. I, I lost her due to my cocaine abuse. And uh, I named her Destiny. And so Destiny's named for someone that didn't have a destiny, which was my child. And it's a new destiny in God. And so any girl that comes into the Destiny house instead of the devil's destiny that might have been you know, written out in them, that the world told them that they'd never be anybody, now they have a choice to change their life and the God's destiny. You know, like Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the thoughts and the plans I have for you, a future and hope not for evil, but for good. That's what they have at that house. I just wanna speak right now to all the ladies and the teens and the women out there that might be, right now you're selling your body Maybe you have a pimp. Maybe your pimp is the club you're working for. Maybe it's just a phone girl. Maybe it's your own site that you're selling your body on. And you're just feeling like there has to be a change in your life and that maybe what you've done, you can't take back. You know what? That's a lie of the enemy. God can change your life. God can come into your heart and show you maybe the reasons why you're doing it. And God can heal you. There is hope. I never thought that God could love me again. I thought God was angry. I was taught that God was angry at me, but that is a lie. You know, there's something called religion. It's man's attempt to come to God. And that is nothing what Jesus taught. That is nothing of who the God that I believe in. Real relationship is knowing that God loves you and you can communicate with Him and God can change your heart and it doesn't have to happen overnight. 
He loves you just the way you are, right where you're at. You don't have to clean up to come to church. You don't have to clean up to have a friend that's a Christian. He loves you just the way they are, way you are, and He comes into your heart and He changes you from the inside out. You, you, you might think that, you know, you might have to be perfect or, you know, to change every single thing you're doing wrong, which you'll know what you're doing wrong because you're going to get convicted of it in your heart. But that's, that's totally a lie. God changes you from day to day to day to day, and every day gets better. And as long as you're moving forward, I'm going to tell you something. God can change your whole life and flip it around, and you actually can be used by God to help other girls and to even rescue girls. And maybe you just, you know, maybe God just wants you to speak to them and tell them that they're loved. You know, God loves you no matter where you've been, what you've done. I don't care how crazy your past is. Maybe you've done crazier things than I have. He loves you. He loves you unconditionally. And he, and he wants to know you. I just encourage anyone that's watching right now, if you feel God tugging at your heart, if you feel that, that maybe that guilt is so overwhelming, you can't, you can't get beyond it, just know this, that God is greater than all your guilt. God is greater than all your shame. God is greater than all your unforgiveness in your heart. Hey, yeah, I know it's easy to say, forgive that person that hurt you. You know what? It starts with a step. You invite Jesus into your heart because God, God forgave you. Jesus forgave you. That's what he died on the cross for. Do you know that Jesus was sold just like you're selling yourself? He was sold for 30 pieces of silver. And if you think Jesus doesn't understand brutality, he doesn't understand getting beat down, bleeding. He doesn't understand being choked, spit on, yelled at. And for 30 pieces of silver, he understands trafficking more than we all realize. And I just want you to know something. If you give your life to him today, you're not going to ever be the same. I'm not going to lie to you and say it's going to be easy as pie now to change your life. You just let God do it and just follow what the, what the Bible teaches you. Find a good church. Find some good mentors around you to help talk you out of some desperate situations. And I'm going to tell you what, God can make miracles happen in your life. You just have to believe. He just asks for us to believe.